I'm giving the same talk in October uh, at the Festival of Ideas. But I've been again this past two weeks reading about her life and I want to talk a little bit about Pandit Ramabai. There's a lot of information there and I know that you'll have your own chance to go on the internet and find what you can find about her life. But as an Indian, I want to stand here and um, honor her life, speak about her life, speak with a passion that comes from ways in which you're trying to understand the arc of her life. You know, it's, uh, it's over a hundred years ago that she lived. And you're trying to discern the arc of her life and what can it teach us today as we seek to be social reformers. The fact that she's unknown is, I think, significant because there are people you will meet in the state of Maharashtra today who um, would have grown up in one of these homes, the center that she started, uh, who, who were women who were orphans, who grew up there, who then was able to get a job because they give you job training. They get married and then they still remember this place where they grew up, Mukti Mission. But I'm going, before we get there, let me um, just start with talking about Pandit Ramabai. Um, so a couple of things about her life. She was given um, the title Pandita, which is the feminine for Pandit, which means wise teacher, someone who has uh, extraordinary scholarship. And uh, you want to know why she was given the title. And the second title she was given, which was um, uh, sort of out of honor, is Saraswati. It's actually a name of a goddess, which actually means the goddess of learning. Uh, and she was given these titles at a quite an early age. In her early 20s, she got these titles from the University of Calcutta, which at that time was the capital of uh, British India. But before um, she got these titles, you want to know what, what, what is it about her life that makes us want to stop and learn about her. She was a social reformer, uh, particularly the work she did for women in India, uh, seeking to bring empowerment to women. She was a feminist before there was a feminist movement. Um, she was, in fact, a pioneer. In, if you study feminist literature, there's you know, first generation feminism, second generation feminism, third generation feminism. She was doing feminism before there was even a proper first generation feminism in the early part of, uh, early part of the 20th century. She was also somebody who was passionate about education, particularly getting uh, girls in India to study mathematics, astronomy, biology. She wanted women to study medicine so that she could give treatment. Uh, they could help treat uh, illness and cure diseases. But the other thing about her life, not only is she a scholar, a social reformer, someone who is wanting to have education, um, she um, was a Bible translator um, and also saw a revival happen in India. So you wonder how in one person's life you can combine so many things. So who is this woman, uh, Ramabai? So let me tell you a bit more about her background. Um, to understand her life, you need to know a little bit about Hinduism. And if any of you have spent any time studying or reading or finding out about Hinduism, you will know that one of the things Hindus say is that Hinduism is not actually uh, kind of a religion like Christianity is or Islam is, which are exclusive religions. Hinduism is sort of a universal religion. It's, it's the religion of humanity. It's been around for 5,000 years. It's for everybody. Uh, of course, there's also an aspect of Hinduism that includes um, many gods. And um, another aspect of Hinduism is the whole idea that reincarnation or salvation is the final escape from the cycles of birth and rebirth that only happens when you're finally born as a Brahmin man. So in, in the last stage of your recycles in going through birth and rebirth, you get to the, being a Brahmin man and then finally you can escape those sort of the cycle of reincarnation. India at that time when Ramabai was, in fact the year she was born in 1958, 1858 was one year after there had been this Indian mutiny or as Indians call uh, India's first war of independence. You also have to know a little bit about the caste system and in India there's something called the caste system in which people are sort of, there's an anthropology where people are, uh, they're born into certain caste and based on what caste you're born into, your profession or your destiny is, in life is determined. So there's the names of the caste. Um, depending on which part of India you go to, there are different um, names given to the caste, but generally it's four um, um, sort of categories. The Brahmins at the top, the Kshatriyas, the Vaishnavas and the Sudras. The Sudras are basically the laborers. And then you have the fifth group, which is the untouchables who are not part of the caste system, they're not even human beings. Um, what were the issues that women at that time were dealing with in India? What are the social evils that were affecting India? This is, I'm just giving you the world into which Ramabai was born into. Um, 
but four of them that I mentioned there, basically when girl babies were born, parents usually tried to kill them because having a girl child was um, considered bad omen, considered uh, financially uh, a burden, um, and people would usually take their girl babies into the forest kill them. So if there was female infanticide, partly because of all the problems families would have when they had a girl child. But then you had the thing of girls were being married off at the age of six or seven. In fact, Ramabai's mum was nine years old when she married Ramabai's father, who was 44. Um, and um, child marriage was prevalent. And then there's something called sati, which is the practice in India, which the British outlawed, of course. Um, but it was also prevalent and still practiced around India, which is when, let's say, a nine-year-old girl marries a man and uh, her husband dies in the next couple of years. He's 44. Life expectancy was about 40 years old in India at that time. What she had to do was she had to sort of be thrown into the fire where the funeral pyre was being, where the husband's body was being burnt. Um, and so that was very normal. Uh, in fact, there's been case, it's outlawed in the constitution of India, but it still happens in India today. Uh, and of course, girls who escape all of these things, if they become widows, would end up as temple prostitutes, where they basically their families would leave them in temples and the priest would exploit them sexually. So this is the kind of world in which um, she was born into. Interestingly, oh, of course, finally, we also need to know that a lot of mission activities are going on in India, a lot of missionaries. If you look at the history of the 19th century British missions movement, there were a lot of missionaries working in India. And there were also some Indians involved in social reform movements. So that's the sort of background to her life before this individual is born into the world. So this is the bit where you really have to strain your eyes. I have to strain mine as well. But I'll just get through it and uh, I will um, make sure that there's some key points there that stands out. Her father was a Brahmin from Maharashtra who was somebody who took his profession of being a Brahmin or his sort of destiny as a Brahmin very seriously. And he believed that he shouldn't have any worldly possessions because Brahmins are people that are waiting to go into salvation. And he would travel around India with his family reciting the religious scriptures and people would give them food and places to stay. So they, didn't, they had a very nomadic sort of life. They were always, her family was always traveling around India. And his first wife died and he married um, uh, his second wife, who was nine at the time, Lakshmi Bai, was the mother's name. He was a brilliant uh, man. Again, when we talk about discerning the arc of somebody's life, God, I think in some ways, providentially arranges for who your parents are. I mean, this man, without being in Ramabai's life, Ramabai would not have become the social reformer that she became. He had some convictions in his life. One of the convictions that he had, he had this sort of liberal view for that time that he believed that there was nothing in the Hindu scriptures that said that women should not be taught to read Sanskrit. So he was taken in front of a Hindu council and made to prove why he believed women should be taught Sanskrit. And he showed from their scriptures that there was nothing against it. And they then sort of threw him out of the sort of um, um, the temple or whatever the institution was. And they had to again go back into the forest. And that's where Ramabai was born. She was born in the forest in, in Gangamal Mountains in, in Western Maharashtra on the 23rd of April, 1858. And she was given the name Rama, which is the female name for the god Ram, which basically meant fair or bright. She had a very light skin complexion. Um, and in 1874, when she was 16 years old, her family died. She was the sixth child. And she watched her mother and father and uh, sisters die. And the only person that didn't die was Ramabai and her brother because they were young and I think their bodies somehow, they, was, they were a bit more resilient. So you, you, you see a 16 year old girl um, losing mother and father. And throughout her life, she was constantly confronted with people who were dying. But that experience of dealing with her own family death prepared her in some ways to become somebody who had within her the ability to deal with death as she saw all around her, particularly in later famines when she was involved in rescuing women. She and her brother walked 4,000 miles from the north to the south of India. And one of the ways in which they managed to survive was because her father had taught her the Hindu scriptures, she could recite them. 
and she would go to religious places and stand in public places and recite them and people would sort of give them some offerings and look after them. The only reason we know that she had traveled so much is later on in her life she records places she had been to in her sort of uh, when she was a late teen and in her early 20s and she had talked about places she had been to in Kashmir, places she had gone down to in Tamil Nadu. Anybody who knows India, that's a huge landmass to have traveled at that time. Just she and her brother um, went around reciting Hindu scriptures, begging for food. So they finally get to Calcutta and there was a group of, in Calcutta, which is of course Bengal now, the Bengal presidency, which includes Bangladesh, that was the sort of the center of a cultural renaissance that was going on in India at that time in the 19th century. And there were significant reform movements that were, that were coming out, Hindu reform movements that were coming out of Calcutta. And there, some professors from the University of Calcutta um, began to hear what she was saying and how she was not only reciting scriptures, but she had an ability to, um, she had a sharp mind to be able to answer questions and make connections in this and to give commentary on the Hindu scriptures. And there, there at, in her early 20s, she was given these titles, Pandita and Saraswati. Because these men had never come across, they accepted the fact that she was Brahmin. They knew there was something very special about her, but they had to acknowledge that she was extraordinary as well because of what she was able to just speak. She could stand in front, like, like it's almost like Jesus when he went to the temple and began to speak to the Pharisees and scribes there. Sadly, the only person in her life that she had her security in, in her life at that point, her brother dies in 1880. Uh, and in the same year, she does something very radical for a Brahmin woman. She decided to marry her brother's close friend. Her brother was of course a Brahmin, but he had a friend who was from a Sudra caste, the, the laborer caste, but he was a lawyer. And he, she ends up marrying this man, um, Bipin Bihari Das Medav, Medavi, how you say the name? That's the name of her husband. And they have a, a daughter, uh, and they name her Manorama, which means heart's joy, or like joy to the heart. Because she was so happy to finally be a mother. Sadly, 16 months later, uh, less than two years, her husband dies and she becomes a widow in India. And widows in India are meant to become invisible. They're, they're supposed to not exist. Even the shadow, Brahmins believe if you have a shadow of a widow fall on you, then you've somehow brought a bad karma on yourself and that you might not get into the salvation out of the cycles of birth and rebirth. So basically widows were shunned. But she being this brilliant woman, uh, refuses to um, disappear um, and um, starts, God begins to sort of awaken in her, I think, something of what her life was meant to be uh, for the people that she wanted to make a difference for. At that time when she was in Calcutta, she had got married, they had moved to Assam. So almost, um, you know, there's a sort of a 20 year period there from when she um, came into Calcutta um, and one of the things that happens is there's a guy named Keshab Chandra Sen who is a social reformer that she looks up to. And she believes that he actually can be a role model for her in, in um, being somebody that, because her brother had died, her husband had died, and she needed some man in her life to, to um, help her do what she wanted to do. But interestingly, this man um, forces his own nine or eight year old daughter to get married under social pressure. And she's so disillusioned that this man she looked up to, who was a leader of social reform in India, forces his own daughter to marry when she was not even 10 years old. At this point, God, of course, um, begins to arrange things in her life where a new chapter begins. She meets some Christians in Calcutta, uh, missionaries, um, who, of course, invited to a prayer meeting and which I think was a sort of a church sort of service. And she was appalled there that people from different caste were, were taking communion together. They were, the, the whole laws of purity or pollution really sort of, she was quite put off by it. At the same time, something about Jesus was very attractive to her. She, she sort of began to realize there was something different about Jesus. And in her autobiography, uh, she says that for some reason she found in her library the gospel of 
Luke in Sanskrit. How it got there, she doesn't know. Maybe it belonged to this, her husband or to her, her brother, but there was a Gospel of Luke that she begins to read. She says she's mostly unconvinced by it, but still begins to read um, the Gospel of Luke, and she's met some Christians already. And she's very disillusioned with Hindu leaders, Hindu reform leaders, who are sort of talking about reform, but then forcing their own daughters to get married. It's something similar to what Jonathan was saying. She's constantly encountering the contradictions between what the ideals are of Christianity or the ideals are of Hinduism and then seeing the sort of reality. Um, she gets an opportunity to travel to England in 1883 and the reason she wanted to go to England with her daughter of course is because she felt one of the great needs was to become a doctor so that she can help um, other women particularly as there was not, there was no, initially she was going to go to Madras or uh, Madras to, because that's the only place women could study to be a doctor. Uh, but there she didn't get admission. She had somebody, a missionary that connected to some sisters of charity in, um, in England. And so she came to England in 1883. Unfortunately, what happened was she couldn't study to be a doctor because they found out that she had hearing problems because of the famines that she'd gone through. She had lost her hearing, and they refused to give her admission to train to be a doctor. So she was quite, um, she's, she's here in England, um, she's not able to be a doctor, and she gets involved in going with these sisters to, um, do, to, to be part of this work that they were doing. Um, she was staying in one gate, Wantage, sorry, not one gate, Wantage. And the Anglican sisters were going out, particularly in Fulham, to care for women that were trapped in prostitution. And she was so impacted that there were Christian women, Christian sisters, who could actually go and like show this compassion and love and rescue them. And she said, there has to be an explanation for why I don't see this in India and there are women here who are doing this. And, um, because she made a pledge to the Indian leaders, the Brahmin leaders who she was connected with in India, that when she went to England, one of the things she said she will not do was convert. Because Christianity by the Brahmins was viewed in India as the religion that was from the foreigners, first of all, but it's also a religion that was increasingly being identified with people from untouchable caste. Because those were the people that were converting in India. So the Brahmins were very against Christianity, not only because it was foreign, but it also because a religion in which the, the, the untouchables were joining. So Brahmin becoming a Christian was a scandal that you could never get your head around. And she promised she wouldn't become... Gandhi himself also made a similar promise when he left Gujarat to come to India that he promised his mom he wouldn't become a Christian when he went to London. Um, because it meant that you were giving up everything it, that was Indian. But you know, here she is in London. Her friend, uh, a, a woman named Anandabai Bhagwat, who has also traveled with her. Um, there's a story of when she decided to become a Christian. Um, this friend tried to strangle her in her sleep one time uh, because she didn't want her alive anymore because she thought, you know, she's betrayed everything that she b said in India. Because sadly, this friend herself was going through a crisis in her life and committed suicide. And in the back of the, her, her friend, the Indian friend that she had when she was staying with the sisters in London, um, made her consider deeply about Christ and she became a, a Christian and took uh, baptism on the 29th of, Septem 29th of September in 1883. Of course, uh, this created a backlash in India when they found out because, of course, the British were now using her, the British missionaries were using her as a, some kind of propaganda. She, she gave fodder for, so the, for the missionaries to talk about her, this Brahmin woman, this very eminent Brahmin woman who had become a Christian. Interestingly, again, this, this situation in life where she's, you know, we only know this because of the letters she was writing at that time, where she struggled with the sisters, and I'm going to read you a quote in her struggle, there was one particular sister that was appointed to be sort of her overseer when she was in London. The sister's name was Sister Geraldine, her spiritual mentor. And they got into quite a number of conflicts because these sisters, who are all, of course, um, unmarried, began to sort of question the way Ramabai was raising her daughter, um, Monorama. And she was like, you know, here I am giving up a religion in which women are not given um, you know, women are not treated well. And then she felt like these sisters were asking her to come under the authority of the bishop. And there was a lot of tension that started growing between Ramabai's own sort of independent uh, intellect, 
her wanting to question everything and the institution of the church. Um, and so let me read a quote, which well, in the letter she says, the authority of the church, the nature of the universal church, whether Ramabai would be allowed to teach Sanskrit to boys or how she was teaching her children to pray. These were some of the issues on which she began to have direct confrontation with the sisters. And eventually she, dis she was quite disillusioned and she was going to go back to uh, India. And as Providence would have it, her cousin, who had studied to be a doctor in the US, in Philadelphia, was graduating. And she had an invitation to go to the US. So she traveled uh, to the US. Um, and uh, that was a very significant two years in her life in the US, where there were many, many um, meetings. She was invited to speak. And she wrote her first book there called The High Caste Indian Woman. Um, what is so interesting about uh, Ramabai's life, just as a side, is she knew that if there was going to be reform in India, you've got to engage key stakeholders who have to have a sense of um, investing in what you're doing. You know, if you're thinking about social reform, you can't just think of helping people who are on the margins without also engaging people who are key stakeholders in the power structures. You've got to find sympathetic insiders who are willing to negotiate something with you. And of course, the Americans had a very different mindset of church, of authority compared to the British situation. She found being in the US so liberating. You know, she had a very uh, positive time there, those two years that she's, she was initially going to go for six weeks and ended up staying for two years, traveled across the US. Uh, around the, does anybody know Swami Vivekananda? He was an Indian that went to the World Congress of Religions in Chicago and began to talk about how great Hinduism is. It was, they kind of overlap. In fact, Vivekananda, if you go to India and mention Vivekananda, everybody would know. He's sort of the, uh, one of the greatest Indian ambassadors for Hinduism that the West knows. He and Ramabai actually clashed a lot because Ramabai was wanting to talk about the practical outworkings of Hinduism. And Vivekananda, who went to the World Congress of Religion um, and spoke about Hinduism, wanted to talk about how philosophical Hinduism was just the most incredible thing that the world had ever known. She returns, how are we doing for time? Okay. We've got a few more minutes. Um, so let me read a quote from her book, The High Caste, Hindu Woman. There are thousands of priests and men learned in sacred lore. They neglect and oppress the widows and devour widows' houses, hire them out to wicked men so, they lo so, so long as they can get money. And when the poor, miserable slaves are no longer pleasing to their cruel masters, they, they turned them out in the streets to beg their livelihood, to suffer horrible consequences of sin, to carry the burden of shame, and to finally die the death, worse than that of a starved street dog. The so-called sacred places, those veritable hells of, on earth, have become the graveyards of countless women, widows, and orphans. This was basically the essence of how she saw what Hinduism was doing to Indian women particularly even high caste Brahmin women. And she believed that Christ, Christ alone, is the salvation that Indian women are looking for. So let me quickly sort of say a couple of things when she returned back to India. Initially, um, even before she went to the US, I mean, went abroad, she had started a sort of a, a she was always sort of, a, sort of an entrepreneur as well. She was starting sort of society, she was starting, um, um, this society called the Arya Mahila Samaj was a noble woman society. Um, in 1882, she um, was invited by Lord Ripon, who was the Viceroy of India, to, to make an intervention or to give evidence um, about women's education. And this is what she said there. In 99 cases out of 100, the educated men of this country and here she's having people that she's actually in relationship with and working with. The educated men of this country are opposed to female education and the proper position of women. If they observe the slightest fault, they magnify the grain of mustard seed into a mountain and try to ruin the character of women. March 1889, she had come back from the US and she starts this um, Saradana Sadhan in Bombay which was a house of learning for widows, particularly Brahmin widows. It's interesting, at that point, she didn't want to make any, do anything explicitly Christian. She wanted a place where people could learn, um, you know, like I said, astronomy, biology, just general subjects. But she said people should be allowed to read their own scriptures. And there, she begins to pray 
with the windows of her house open. And some of the young, I mean, when we say widows, they're not old women. You know, widows could be like even like 14, 15 years old. When we're talking about widows, that's how young some of these widows were. Became Christians. And that caused quite a furore. At that point um, in her life, in 1891, around 1891, she is completely banished from Hindu society. For, her, for them, they, she doesn't exist anymore. But it was also significant because at that point in her life, in 1891, she has a deeper conversion. And she writes about it where she says she has known the Christianity of Christ, but she didn't know Christ himself. And she had a deep experience of Christ. And she realizes that some of the things she's dealing with in India are spiritually dark. And that without prayer, you can't confront these evils. So she begins to sort of mobilize the women that she had brought together in this home to pray. And finally, for financial reasons, um, they moved it to Pune, and then they moved it to this place, um, this place that where the center is still there today, uh, called uh, Give Me Anything Free. I will teach you Sanskrit, and you just pay me for it, and then I will sort of live from that. Um, and this is where there was a controversy because the sisters didn't want to teach Sanskrit to the boys. She could teach the girls, but not the boys. Um, so she had had some money, and she'd used this money to buy this sort of huge area, in the, about 100 acres in the forest. And because they got kicked out of Pune because of all the controversy, she moved her whole center with all the women in Bulakats. There's some photo somewhere of them moving to this new location. And there, there were still wild animals, snakes, scorpions, and she moved there. And these women, basically the women she had sort of rescued, built this place up. Literally people who didn't know any building. She started a printing press. She started a, a center for blind women. She, sent it up, she started a center for boys. I mean, she was an entrepreneur scholar, quite an extraordinary woman. I don't know how one individual could have had that much fire in them to keep going and keep going and keep going. And finally, they had a revival there where um, they began to see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And the last thing I want to say about her life uh, as we come to the close, close of it, she decided at this point in her life, having felt like not having done enough, that she was going to translate the Bible into Marathi. Kind of like Martin Luther, actually. Because she felt that the Marathi Bible that existed at that point was a translation from Sanskrit, using a lot of the Sanskrit ideas that, gave, uh, that still gave Brahmins some sort of privilege. And she felt like the translation didn't actually challenge Indian culture enough. So she studies Greek and Hebrew and spends the last decade of her life writing this translation. And because she had a printing house there, just a few months before she died, a Marathi Bible had come out um, that is still used today. It was updated slightly in 1965. And um, before the end of her life, one year before she died, her daughter died. She saw her own daughter die. And yet it didn't stop her from believing that she was on this earth as a Brahmin Indian woman to make a difference in the lives of Indian women who were, in such, who were experiencing such suffering. So finally, her legacy. Um, and I'll stop with that. She translated the Bible into the vernacular language of Marathi, possibly the first and only example of the whole Bible translated by a single woman. Was awarded this Kaiseri Ind medal by the British government in India at that time in 1919 after the war for the work she did. And then in 1989, the government of India issued a stamp, which was there in the first slide, and named her the Woman of the Millennium. Um, and Rama Bhai Mukti Mission still goes on today um, serving young girls and women. Let me finish with this quote that Rama Bhai wrote. People must not only hear about the kingdom of God, but must see it in actual operation, on a small scale perhaps, and in imperfect form, but a real demonstration nevertheless. Thank you.